Notebook 4, Towards the Lorette Charnel House. From the 23rd of December, 1914, to the 2nd of June, 1915. Part 2. It was the 9th of May, and it had started with a storm of cannon, from Arras all the way north to the Belgian border. The bombardment lasted all day long, and, like all storms, it had its pauses and unexpected surges. Battles raged all around Barthas and his comrades. By that evening, to their right, the French had taken the three villages of Ablain saint nazaire La Targette, and Neuville saint vast while to their left the English were fighting terrible battles near the village of Neuve-Chapelle, suffering over 11,000 dead and wounded in a single day. Meanwhile, their own division found itself at the center and had to wait until the enemy was sufficiently pushed back from the attacks on their wings before they marched forward. It was the strange calm eye of a storm. Bartha says that from a purely military point of view, and not a humanitarian one, the results of that first brutal day of combat were satisfactory. But from the next day onwards, they were hitting their heads against the wall, fighting against German reinforcements supported by powerful artillery. All French and English efforts to further exploit their first successes were in vain, and Barthas had this to say of it all. Common sense and simple reason warranted staying with what we had gained and preparing another surprise effect elsewhere. But try telling that to our ignorant generals, who, for weeks and months to come, would pursue a struggle of attrition which consisted of taking and retaking ten times, twenty times, a sunken road, a ravine, a trench, a cemetery, a sugar mill, etc. Places like the Nublet Wood, the Lorette Plateau, the Suchet Ravine, and the muddy plains of Neuville became grim names that represented charnel houses, where almost all army corps would eventually take their turn, bringing their soldiers to be sacrificed for no gain. At least for them, the 9th of May was a relatively calm day, if one ignored all the uncertainty, the fear, and the incredible noise of the battle around them. That day, Bartha's squad was on guard duty, between Annequin and the village of Cambrin, at a point where they almost touched. They had two duties there. The first was to arrest all civilians that did not have passports, while the second, and the one they found far more interesting, was to prevent the entry of alcohol, which the poilus of the army had grown obsessed with. Some of the smugglers slipped right through their hands and escaped, mocking them with all the southern French expressions and insults they had learned. For the answer of the soldiers to this, I will now quote Barthas directly. We therefore had to be especially rigorous in our searches of women suspected of concealing forbidden liquors on their persons. We generally let old women pass by, but we invariably stopped all the young ones and made full use of our prescribed mission in patting down all the round and protruding parts of their anatomies. But in all seriousness, Barthas considered this guard they mounted against alcohol to be completely useless and ridiculous. Anyone who had any motivation to avoid them could cross the fields and backyards of the town at twenty different points where no one was watching. So alcohol kept flowing freely into the hands of the Poilus, and even more so into the hands of their officers, who, as Bartha said, even if they lacked in other examples for us to follow, they always provided in this one. During this guard duty there was also another little incident in relation with passports. A hundred meters from their checkpoint, their comrade Jordi blocked the road, standing guard for smugglers and spies. Jordi was a zealous and enterprising soldier, but was barely literate, and his ignorance would sometimes lead him into making interesting mistakes. <laughs> 
On the road from Manaka came a butcher that was a neighbor of theirs. The butcher came with his horse and wagon, and atop the wagon sat a majestically fat pig. The butcher showed his passport and wanted to continue on his way, but Jordi was following his orders to the letter and refused the entry of the horse and the pig because they did not have passports. It seemed that Jordi was incapable of telling the difference between citizens and animals. The butcher went to the guardhouse and asked for Barthes's intervention, and, to much roaring laughter, the embarrassed and confused Jordi had to let the pig, the horse, and the butcher pass freely. The butcher did not have any hard feelings from this, and in the evening he invited Jordi to drink a tankard of wine with him, as a reward for the zeal in his guard duty to protect the people of Anacan. Another, far less entertaining incident happened that afternoon, when a misshapen piece of steel fell like a thunderbolt just in front of their guardhouse door. Fortunately, they had all been inside at that time, and no one was injured. It turned out that that piece of steel was a fragment from a French 150 millimeter cannon that had exploded nearby. The same day, another cannon blew up in a nearby battery. The constant bombardment was straining the cannons to their limit, and they were apparently becoming as dangerous for the bombarders as for the bombarded, as these explosions inevitably claimed the victims. The last noteworthy event that wrapped up that eventful day was that they witnessed a French airplane crash into the ground right in the middle of the two opposing front lines. That night, one of their patrols bravely crawled in the darkness towards the plane to rescue and bring back the pilot, but it turned out that the airplane had caught fire when it crashed, and the pilot was burned to a crisp. The next day, the division continued with its normal routine. No order had reached them to join the raging battle. No one asked why, and no one was upset by this. Barthas and his comrades made their usual trip to the front-line trenches to relieve the battalion that was there. Immediately, they saw that their trenches had been heavily shelled, but to the relief there had only been three dead and five wounded in the battalion, practically nothing, except for the ones who had been hit. At least it was next to nothing compared to the slaughters of the nearby battlefield, where rifles and cannons fired daily, non-stop. One afternoon, while in the front-line trenches, they witnessed from their positions an assault of a regular infantry regiment on the nearby German-occupied village of Lou. The regiment charged and almost reached the village, but despite their bravery, the violent German counterattacks pushed them back to their starting point, and that regiment was almost completely wiped out along with the supporting 281st Regiment from Barthas's division. The days passed until, on May 15th, they received the unexpected news that their sector would be relieved by a Scottish regiment. Four days earlier, the regiment to their left had already been relieved by the English, so they had already had some interactions with them. Barthas commented that the English soldiers were apparently fed exclusively with biscuits and preserves, which made it so they regularly came to the French trenches to gather up scraps of bread off the ground or to scrape up the bits of leftover ratatouille from their plates, in exchange for which the grateful English gave them tobacco and cigarettes, which they seemed to have in abundance. Now the English were relieving them completely, and Bartha says that the Poilus left the Vermel sector with many regrets. It had been one of the quietest sectors on the front for the past few months, and they were now worried about where they were being taken, and if they would ever find a sector as nice as that one. With time and tranquility, the soldiers in the Vermel sector had developed it into a place that was extremely comfortable compared to others. Even at the front line, each group of two three or four men had their own guitone, a little hole that served as a comfortable place to rest after hours of hard labor or guard duty. <laughs>
In those gitons they could stretch over an armful of straw and warm themselves with a fire that was fed with the timbers from the Vermel coal mine. Throughout the day and night, flames and smoke emerged from hundreds of little chimneys across the front line before the eyes of the Germans, who respected them because they did the exact same thing on their side. And, back on the second line, the scene was even more picturesque. Here, some of the gitons had been turned into veritable villas, with materials and furniture taken from the ruins of Vermel. In Bartha's squad, they had built a real house, with a door, windows, a dining room, table, chairs, mirrors, camp beds, and a large fireplace. Every time they cycled back, the men returned to the same places and were relieved by the same units which made it feel that they were constantly improving their quarters. They took pleasure in the simple comforts of their simple houses. Their roofs were made with a few planks, a sheet of metal, some tarpaulins, and a little earth on top. At this time the horrible minion were for mortars of the Germans, with their heavy shells, were unknown in their sector, so these roofs were more than enough. Despite the soldiers' regrets at leaving their comfortable shelters and all the hard work that had been involved in making them, they were assured that their English allies would come and attack in their place. So the English were welcomed with open arms, and the Poilus were quite happy to leave the scene. The relief took place under heavy rain and strong winds in the night of the 15th to the 16th of May. While they passed through Vermel, they were enjoying some coffee when a volley of 105 mm shells crashed around them, as if the Germans had known exactly where they were. At the first whistle of a shell, by instinct, they had all flattened against bits of wall or stretched out in the mud, so their company, luckily, only had one man wounded. But this parting gift from the Germans seemed in very bad taste and they decided to leave the Ruin Vermel as quickly as possible. It was apparent that they had overstayed their welcome. Soon after, they passed through the sleeping Anneka. Parthas was sure that some of its inhabitants would have awakened if they had known they were leaving. Reconciliation was now complete, and the soldiers and civilians had gotten to know each other. Friendships and intimacies had been created, and romances had been created, deepened, and even broken in different ways. Some had even led to marriages carried out by the town's mayor. They left Taneka in silence, and at dawn arrived at the mining town of Neulemin, where no real effort was made to greet the 280th regiment. Many were deeply hurt by this indifference. As Bartha said, for the past six months they had been sacrificing themselves, making a wall with their corpses in front of this village so it would not suffer invasion. To not even be thanked was painful. Their company had to build it at the stable of a dirty farm that was falling apart. It was so cramped that a quarter of them could not even find a place to put down their packs and gear. So they had to leave it outside, exposed to the elements. They had been better housed in the trenches and envied the Scotsmen who were now resting in their gitoons. Meanwhile, the officers and non-coms installed themselves magnificently in a very spacious house nearby. Some men held to the hope that perhaps remorse would make them find the Poilus some better shelter for the next night. The next day, Barthas decided to kill some time by visiting the town's cemetery, which was right next to their farm. In his visit, he seemed to suffer of culture shock. Barthas wrote that he did not want to say that the people in the north of France had less reverence for the dead than elsewhere, but he did not like that the cemeteries he saw there had no wall to speak of around them, instead being surrounded by a simple hedge or even by nothing at all. For him, it was negligent not to build a high wall around the cemetery, because, even though the dead were not going anywhere, he considered it important to not leave their place of infinite rest to the mercy of incursions by cats and dogs, 
and to the indiscreet curiosity of passers-by. He entered the cemetery, deeply annoyed that all he had to do to achieve this was effortlessly step over a simple strand of wire. Then he looked around at the cemetery. It was very large, large enough to bury two or three generations of its inhabitants, though Barthas knew it would soon have to be expanded, because it was being filled every day with all the soldiers that died at the first aid station before they could be evacuated. During the season of offensives, five or six men were buried in the cemetery each day. Barthas attended the burial of that day's batch. It was quickly done like a boring chore by territorials whom the war had turned into grave diggers. They excavated a long ditch and put the coffins in a line right next to each other to use the space as efficiently as possible. Then they shoveled the dirt on top, put a little cross with a name and a number, and that was it. Then the territorial gravediggers continued their exhausting work, digging in the ditch under a strong sun that made the air heavy and difficult to breathe because it was necessary to have space for the ones that were coming the next day, and the day after that, in all the days that would come, bringing new dead for that sinister ditch. Barthas left this sad spectacle that was a commonplace scene of the war and returned to his billet. There he found to his surprise that everyone was getting ready to leave. For a moment he thought that at last they had been found a better place to stay, but soon was informed to his disappointment that they were leaving Nolamine in an hour. After going through seven consecutive months of trench duty, and a long and harsh winter full of suffering, the soldiers thought they deserved at least a good month of rest. But that impression was not shared by their big bosses, and the very day they were supposed to leave for rest, they were forced to make a half-turn back towards the front. After an hour's march, they arrived at the village of Mazingarble Brevi, where the first thing they were welcomed by was a volley of flares. Mazingar Lebrebi was a large village very near to the front lines, but despite this, almost all of its inhabitants had stayed, even though the shells sometimes claimed victims. The soldiers stayed there for around two weeks. It was not possible to do exercises and drills during the day, because they were in plain sight of the enemy, so their superiors made them carry out maneuvers and forced marches during the night to keep them in shape. Additionally, every second day, each company had to be on alert, with their packs hoisted and ready to leave for the front lines at the first signal. It was also at Mazingarb where their uniforms with red trousers and dark blue overcoats were changed for new sky-blue uniforms. Here I must make a brief aside to explain. The reason for this change in uniforms was that the previous French uniforms which had remained pretty much unchanged since the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71, to had proved to be far too dangerous. As you may have noticed, their bright colors belonged to the 19th century warfare, and made it so they were very easy to spot and shoot at from a distance. During 1915, the French army would change those uniforms for the new sky-blue uniforms that were far more practical. They also introduced for the first time steel helmets in the form of the Adrian helmet in order to protect the soldiers' heads from the dangerous fragments produced by explosions, though Barthes and his division would not receive those helmets until a few weeks later, about June 24th. But let us now return to the story. Bartha says that while they were changing their uniforms, they had to undergo no less than five inspections, while their superiors were trying to figure out exactly where to place the regimental patches. They sewed and unsewed the patches so many times that eventually the colonel himself had to intervene and make the final decision. Additionally, their new commandant Nadeau started carrying out several dirty tricks and enforcing discipline to such rigorous levels that it rapidly made all the men regret the loss of his predecessor. 
the Commandant Garceau, who had been so good to them. Among the new punishments that Nadeau inserted into daily life was that soldiers now risked jail time for venturing into the town streets before the evening meal. It was too bad if a poor soldier was simply leaving the grocers with a piece of cheese. A patrol would immediately snatch him up and drag him to jail. Nadeau also decided to intervene in the sick bay. Every day at sick bay there were many men that were truly ill, and some that were not, just like in every sick bay. The commandant was furious at seeing how people were using this to evade his rules against going out before evening, and so he imposed a week of prison for all those who went there and were found to not have anything wrong with them. Even Captain Houdel was punished by the commandant, because he had not imprisoned four men in his company who had not passed the medical inspection with the grade of medical consultation justified. So the captain himself was slapped with a week of jail time. Bartha said that he admired Captain Houdel more for this punishment than for all his battlefield commendations combined. Now, at this point in the notebook, Bartha says that it was time to talk about their chef major, their chief medical officer, better known to the Poilus as their undertaker. They all wondered if this man had ever stepped a single foot inside any kind of medical school, because he never recognized anyone that was truly sick who presented himself at sick call, with the exception of a few times when he observed that the patients were in utter agony. One of Barthas's comrades, who was in treatment at the evacuation hospital of Nelemin, had heard their chief medical officer say, I do not want to see anyone from the 280th regiment unless he is dead. At sick call, the men were always greeted with insults, verbal abuse and sarcastic remarks, or, when the chief major was in a good mood, with terrible jokes that were always in the worst possible taste. Additionally, the major did not get along with Captain Houdel, and, because he was not brave enough to confront the captain directly, he took it out on the Poilus under Houdel's command at every opportunity. Whenever someone from the 21st Company presented himself, the chief major would personally attend him, and, even if the man was extremely ill and under great suffering, he would mark them as not sick. Bartha said that it would take an entire book to tell all the cruel things this cruel doctor did. Instead, he would just mention a few of the incidents he personally witnessed. One time, a private who was in Bartha's squad fell gravely ill. He went to sickbay three times and was not officially recognized. He tried again on the fourth day, and the chef major simply told him, I can see that you're sick, all right but you're in this war to die. What does it matter whether you die from a bullet or sickness? Get out and do not let me see you again. The sick private decided it was useless to try again, and, no longer able to eat anything, he simply begged his comrades to leave him alone to die in his hole. It is important to note that, to reach sick bay, the men had to go about a kilometer to the rear following a railroad line. This path was in full view of the Germans, so unless it was a foggy day, men who were short had to walk crouched over, while those who were tall had to crawl along on all fours and stick close to the embankment if they did not want to get shot. And the misery did not stop when they reached the first aid station, because this was installed inside a toll house that was mostly incinerated and half demolished. The waiting room was on a portion of the building that did not have a roof, door, windows or chairs. The sick men had to sit on debris, rubble and half-burned beams exposed to the elements until the major emerged from his cellar and began the sick call in the second part of the building which was still standing. Barthas, in his capacity as corporal of the day, frequently had to attend these sick call visits and witnessed how the major treated the men. To one soldier who complained about having a bad heart that was beating too fast, 
The major said that he only had to worry when it stopped beating, then marked him as not sick. To another man who complained about not being capable of eating, he kicked him out, saying that there was nothing better than the air of the trenches for the appetite, and so on with every sick man. Barthas also had to go there once when he had a sore throat. The doctor simply instructed him to gargle with warm water and a few drops of tincture of iodine, and then told him to get lost. When Barthas tried to ask for the tincture of iodine, the doctor said that he should find it himself. The major would keep the medicine for men who were sicker than him. And about that sick private who the doctor left to die in a hole, Barthas and the rest of the men in the squad were very worried for him, and so talked with Lieutenant Cordier, a good man that commanded in their company. The lieutenant was furious and helped them to bring the sick private to the dressing station against the major's will, making it so that the major was forced to evacuate the private just to get him out of the way. About the fate of this man, Bartha says he did not have any more news and did not know what happened to him in the end. There was also another sad incident with a man from Barthas' squad called Lados. The cold had swollen his feet so bad that they cracked all over and formed one big wound. The major simply prescribed him warm baths, something impossible in the trenches. The major additionally exempted Lados from work details, adding the cruel detail that instead he could stand guard at the parapet, so, at each change of the guard, they witnessed the sad scene of Private Lados heading out two hours early for the trenches. His feet were wrapped in rags and sandbags, and he hobbled on on two crutches, dragging himself towards the front line, where, out of pity, everyone let him have it easy. At one of the sick call visits, two of Lados's toenails came right off in the fingers of the major, who simply said he still had eight which was more than enough to walk with. This major was also despicable during the days of big offensives, when he could be heard shouting like a madman at the stretcher bearers, saying that they were only bringing him dead men. To the major, gravely wounded men were nothing more than a waste of time. Additionally, the major would never be seen anywhere near a place that was bombarded heavily, and he never went out to take care of wounded men, saying that there was no reason to risk the lives of healthy men to take care of those who were dying. In such terrible circumstances, a man could consider himself very lucky indeed if he had real friends that would take care of him and bring him back to the rear. Despite numerous protests, denunciations and petitions to the authorities, they all had to endure this butcher in the guise of a doctor until the day he got a promotion and went away to some faraway hospital to torture the patients there. But let us now leave this pathetic and cruel man, this despicable individual that brought nothing but pain to the man in his care, and that deserves nothing more than contempt. Let us leave him behind and return to the rest of the story. Barthas and his squad were billeted on a farm in the outskirts of the village of Mazingarb. Under a covered passageway that linked the courtyard to the road, there were two empty pig pens that were occupied by half of the squad. The other half settled above, in a place that had once held rabbits, but now had nothing more than a horde of rats. These rats would constantly jump on their bags, eat their knapsacks and food, and run over the poilus when they were trying to sleep. This forced the soldiers to wrap their heads in their blankets, making it very hard to breathe in an attempt to protect their noses, eyes and ears. The rats were so terrible that in the end Barthas was forced to sleep outside in a cart in the middle of the courtyard, risking sickness with the cold nights, but at least avoiding contact with the dirty rodents. The village around them was now in a poor condition and was full with refugees from the regions of Lou and La Bazé. These refugees lived in terrible conditions and many times in outright misery. 
The soldiers took their meals by squad from cooking pots that were set against one of the walls of the farm's courtyard, and, from the first day, the aroma of their southern-style meals prepared by Therese, their expert cook, attracted two refugee seven-year-old kids that were brothers and who shared with the Poilus their sad story. The kids were from Lou. Their father had been mobilized and together with their mother they had to flee from the German invasion. They had fled to Mazingarb with nothing and eventually their mother had fallen ill. She was now hospitalized in the town of Bethune and the kids now survived on charity and slept in an old abandoned house on a pile of old cloth bags. Bartha says that during their stay in Mazingarb, those two kids always had their ration of soup or ratatouille, and they only left the soldiers' billets to do errands for their cook. The soldiers came to love the two kids and were full of affection for them. Bartha thought that perhaps this was because deep inside they were all grown-up kids themselves. One day, a neighbor woman who was going to Bethune took the kids to see their mother, who had just died from her illness. Despite the fact that none of the Poilus had much money, they made a collection in the squad, with each soldier contributing his meager coin, so that the orphans could put a bouquet of flowers on their mother's grave, and buy some provisions for their small journey. Barthas never knew what happened to those two little orphans. In the end, they had to depart from the village and leave the children behind. The children begged them not to leave them alone, saying they would behave well and asking the Polus to take them along. But they had to leave, and this bitter separation made the soldiers think of all those who had children and what would happen to their children with the war. At this time, there was no talk of furloughs, of rest or leaves. It was all talk about a war to the bitter end and continued offensives. Perhaps they would never see their own children again. Another group of people they got to know at Mazingar was the inhabitants of the farm they were lodged in. At the beginning, they received the Poilus very poorly, refusing to lend them anything to help complement their kitchen supplies, such as plates, pots or pans. They also sent a 12-year-old kid to follow them constantly and keep watch on everything they did. Eventually, the Palus discovered that all this coldness and suspicion was because a few days before they got there, some light infantrymen who had preceded them in the farm stole some chickens and ducks together with a few dozen eggs. This had bred an understandable mistrust, but in the end it did not take too long to establish good relations. The Poilus helped all they could by working in the vegetable garden, and, when the farmers saw how clean they kept their billets and how careful they were not to steal or damage anything in the farm, they started to think better of them than they did of the light infantrymen. When the Poilus left, everything in the village was available to them, and when they shook hands with those honest people, they saw they had tears in their eyes. To Barthas it seemed that the warmth of the southerners had broken through the coldness and reserve of the northerners, who, at the core, were good and decent people like everyone else. Barthas says that during their stay in that farm there was only a single incident. One evening they were enjoying their meal, which consisted of a potful of string beans, a rare treat for them during those days, when their sergeant Baruto, who was holding out his mess tin, let out a sudden loud cry and fell to the ground, unconscious. The shocked man tried to see what had happened and discovered that the casing of a shell that had been fired at an enemy plane had fallen and struck the noncom on the back, creating an ugly contusion. Luckily, they had been standing along a wall with an espaliered pear tree, and the shell fragment had first hit one of the branches of that tree, losing velocity. If the casing had not hit the branch, it would have killed Sergeant Baruto immediately. It was another grim reminder of how death constantly hung over their heads. And so was life until on the night from May 29th to the 30th, they had to depart from Mazingarb, being replaced by the English. They did not know where they were heading, 
Their grenadiers left at six in the evening for the trenches in a place called the White Earthworks, while another battalion headed out for the front soon after. Their own battalion left around midnight, probably following the previous one. Soon they saw the front nearby. It was a volcano that erupted with flares of every color. There was a continual rumbling of cannon fire, inside which could be distinguished the cruel crackling of machine gun fire and grenades going off. The soldiers knew what this was. It was the terrible Lorette sector. Thousands had already died there. It was beyond any doubt that now it would be their turn to be thrown into its jaws. But at the last moment, at a crossroads, their battalion turned right, towards the rear and away from the infernal battle. The soldiers were relieved, and their packs felt much lighter. They traveled the kilometers easily and were filled with joy. Alas, they did not know that three days into the future, they would have to retrace those very same kilometers in the opposite direction. The morning of the next day, May 30th, at about five o'clock, they halted at the slope of a valley. At the bottom of the valley, half hidden in the greenery, was the village of Uden, where they would be billeted, together with a pretty little river. Halfway down the slope there was a church that overlooked the village and that attracted faithful from twenty kilometers around because it had as a relic a few scraps of human bone sealed up in a glass jar that supposedly had belonged to John the Baptist, though Barthas was very skeptical as to how those remains made it from the banks of the River Jordan to a small church in the Pas de Calais. They had stopped on that slope to wait for news on their assigned lodgings. The soldiers stretched out in ditches along the side of the road, lying on wet grass and had to wait quite a long time. Finding lodgings for the Poilus was at the bottom of the priority list while for the officers it was a completely different story. For each officer it was essential to find a comfortable bed and a bedroom worthy of welcoming him. Barthas complained that no officer could ever share a bunk with a soldier without dishonoring himself. Finally, the soldiers were led into the village. Barthas' section was led to a sheepfold that was no longer appropriate for holding sheep. It was made of straw and wattle, and looked like it could collapse at any moment. The walls were full of holes, and countless drafts blew through it. And, to make things worse, the sheepfold was at the end of a road that was crossed day and night by all kinds of trucks and automobiles that made such a noise that it was impossible to sleep unless one was completely deaf. They all wondered why they had been brought to Houdin. Some thought that perhaps they had come for a nice long rest, but those hopes were soon dashed. During the morning of June 1st, the order arrived to leave for the front that very evening. Their big rest had lasted two days. At about five o'clock in the afternoon, they left Houdin and followed the same road they had taken two days before, now in the opposite direction. This incoherence from high command cost the soldiers 50 kilometers on foot, but their fatigue was not important for their superiors. At 11 at night, they arrived at the town of Sans and Gohel. There were several hundred charming red brick houses with pretty gardens, but these lodgings were not for them. No one had been waiting for them, and no preparations had been made to receive them. The soldiers had to wait for daybreak, clustering along the streets that separated the ranks of houses. One of the soldiers, a comrade of Barthas called Paul Combs, complained in a loud voice with no gentle words of exactly what kind of people he thought they were being commanded by. This statement, which was sacrilegious to all discipline and militarism, reached the ear of a non -com, who probably thought the same thing, but knew it was not in his best interest to let it slide. So, he reported these words to Captain Houdel. The captain was furious and did his duty of leading the man to a court-martial, which ended up sentencing him to two years of prison and to separation from the regiment, all for a single loud complaint. <laughs> 
The next day, at roll call, it was announced that they would depart for the trenches that very evening. The soldiers simply stayed in bunches along the avenues. There was no use seeking out comfortable billets. They were now going to Lorette, and no comfort awaited them there. Here ends the fourth notebook. Until now, Barthas and his comrades had been saved from the terrible offensive. But soon it will be their turn to enter a new and terrible battlefield of unprecedented slaughter. Until that moment, I do not have anything more to say. I hope you have a good day, and I'll see you next time.